Rob, yes, sir. excellent guitar playing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't that. know how people like you and Ed can do it. It's like you wake up and you're warmed up. Is that what happens? I don't know how Ed does it. <laughs> I know how I do it, and that's not very well, but I know how Ed does it. Oh, Lord. Well, we, Brad, all want to, we all want to be Ed. That, well, this is true. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be Ed? I, I definitely look at him, and he's got all the missing pieces that I've always been looking yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. You know? And he just seems like he he needs no warm up. He's just he's yeah on eleven from get from the get go. He is on. Well, Rob, before we get to know you a little okay. bit, everybody I know is wondering about this gorgeous guitar. This is Please my baby. Tell us. Yeah, this is um. We went to the Gibson Custom Shop back right before COVID, so I want to say it was sometime in 20, late 2019. And I thought, you know, I'm here. Here's the wood shop. I'm gonna pick out some wood and I'm gonna build a guitar. So uh, I decided, I'd been eyeing these uh, reissue 59s for a while. And uh, I thought if I don't do it now, you know, so I picked out a top for it, this top here, and uh, put my order in and got it during COVID. And uh, man, I love this guitar. It's uh, it's everything you dream about. Oh yeah, what a way to brighten up lockdown. Yeah. And se seriously, I mean, that is, not only is that one of the best tops, and I we heard as you were bringing the guitar in here, Aaron and other people commenting about it, that the top is just amazing. It moves, on there. yeah. It's it's it it looks different depending on the light and the angles, but um, yeah, it's a it's a killer top. And the setup on that guitar. I mean, it is it is just phenomenal. This guitar, play, I've, I've had a couple people that play lots of Les Pauls tell me this is one of the best ones they've ever played. And it plays like a dream. It, yeah. yeah. I do incredible. the top wrap thing, which, you know, if you, there's uh, people for and against it on Facebook. But um, I, it gets a little bit lighter tension using the 10 to 46 strings, so mm -hmm. it just makes bending that much easier. I wouldn't say it's a huge difference, but it makes a little bit of a difference. I know a few months ago that the, the top rap thing became a, a real topic of contention yeah. and it's like, how can you turn this into controversy? Right. Yeah. You, you, yeah. If you it's don't like it, don't do it. Yeah. It's a personal <laughs> preference right. thing. And it's, yeah, I've had mine both ways. I don't even remember how I've got mine yeah. set right now. But, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm digging it for now, so we'll see. Very I might cool. Change my mind later on it. Yeah. but you never know. That's the great thing about it. Yes. I can do whatever I want. For and sure. You can do whatever you want. Well, people who do know you probably know you as the deal maker in chief <laughs> here, and uh, or maybe matchmaker in chief. Matchmaker. Yeah, I'm but, a matchmaker. Uh, that's a good. That's a good way to put it. You definitely are, and I see. Someone, you know, luckily your your office is near to the studio here, and you work hard to try to find the right guitar for people. You really do. Well, that yeah, I mean, ordering a guitar online is hard enough, right? I mean, you don't get to put your hands on it, you don't get to play it, you don't get to plug it in. So, we take it we take it really seriously um, as a, as a, you know, we've got to do the best thing we can from our point here to to make make the right choice for the customer you know we have a great return policy and sometimes we don't always get it right the first time mm -hmm. um, but we we really try to listen and understand what the customer is looking for and try to pick the best guitar even sometimes if that means you know they they've said hey I'm interested in this one sometimes that means saying yeah I don't think that's based on what you're telling me I don't think that's the guitar you want maybe consider this and uh, people really seem to appreciate our attention to detail and just the time we take to try to make it a good fit. Yeah, you really do. You put a, you put a lot of work into it. That's it's quite obvious and I think the customers And what helps notice. is that we all play and we play a lot of these guitars that come in. So yeah. when someone says I'm looking for this that and the other, I'm like I know what guitar that yeah. is. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, to t take a step back, I mean, let's how did you get started on your musical journey? You East Coast, correct? Connecticut area. Well, I spent some time like there. I'm not from there. Well, okay, fill me in. I I'm don't know. I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri, and I call the Kansas City area home. Um, 
I've been all over the place, you know, as a kid, spent some time out in California, um, then back to the Midwest, St. Louis area, um, San Antonio, Texas, Hartford, Connecticut, uh, Cincinnati area, and now here. So I've been, been around the block a few times. Wow. Well, who was, what, what made you get started on guitar? Who well, I've it? said this in several interviews and videos. I, being 10, 11, 12 years old, my dad had an acoustic guitar around the house, so I kind of fiddled around on that. Um, but I, you know, started going to concerts with my parents at around 11, 12 years old. Started uh, getting, hanging out with some older guys that were hipping me to certain music, particularly Van Halen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, used to ride my bike down to the local record store every time I'd get an allowance and buy a, buy a Van Halen record until I had them all, you know. Uh, but Van Halen came through. We were living in Wichita, Kansas at the time, and they came through on the 1984 tour. Oh wow! And my folks took me, and that that was the that was the life changer right there. I wanted to be Eddie Van Halen. He looked like he was having so much fun and just serious. It was loud and it was it was aggressive, and uh, I just loved it. Yeah, Van Halen, especially in I mean I don't I, I thought throughout their career, no matter who was in, you know front man. There was always great performances there. I got yeah. to see him with just about every configuration, but that that first band, and especially my, my first time seeing him was like two weeks before the first album dropped, and mm -hmm. nobody knew who they were. They were opening up for Aerosmith. I and, can't imagine seeing them fresh, you know, for the first time. Yeah, I, our I minds oh. were blown and. Just like you said, I never had seen a band having so much fun on yeah, stage. Yeah, It was just amazing. And off the stage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, after that acoustic guitar and uh, the but, Van but, Halen. But I'm sorry, but back to the Van Halen, you said something about being kind of a fan of both singers. Oh, of all, yeah. Yeah, all of, of them, yeah. So, The Roth era is definitely home for me. Mm -hmm. But I loved them with Sammy too. I mean, they made. I mean, they really made some great music with Sammy. Oh yeah, definitely. And I think Eddie really went outside his normal box and got more melodic and more musical with Sammy. Well, I know right at the time when Van Halen came out, Montrose was my. Mm -hmm. they, I would just loved Montrose. Yeah. So you know, just whenever I saw that. The merger of that singer into the into the band. But I remember, band. I remember it's when great. I remember when the first single came out with Sammy. I think it was "Why Can't This Be Love" mm -hmm. from Fifty yeah. One Fifty. The first couple of times hearing that, I was like, "Oh, I don't know." It grew on me, but it was it was such a departure. You know, Dave came out with Steve Vai and yeah. Billy mm -hmm. Sheehan, and it was like Yankee Rose and all. that. I was like, "Yeah," and then Van Halen and. Okay, <laughs> but and, I loved it. Yeah, the songs did have to grow on you, I guess, but yeah, the first time that Eddie turned his guitar off and started playing keyboard, I'm going, why? Yeah. Why are you doing <laughs> Yeah, because he can. Yeah, that's right. But it was right around then, too, that I got my first uh, electric guitar, and that's, that's when I got serious. And what was that? It was a Fender uh, Bullet Stratocaster. My first two electric guitars were Fender Strats, and that's why they're that's still as much of a Gibson fan as I am. I'm I'm that much of a Fender fan too, and I love Strats, and I still have you know I have two or three of them. I will always have a Strat that will always kind of be home to me. Yeah, you've got a gorgeous one that I usually see hanging in your office there. <laughs> that I was yeah. big on that one. Yeah. Well, so the bands you were in, mm -hmm. King Whack is the one that I know about okay. from, from I guess, before you came here. Were there any bands prior to that that you were in? Well, I, I, my, the first professional band I played in, cover band, I was 15 years old. And these were guys that are what, the age that I am now, so in their 40s, mm -hmm. approaching 50. And uh, I, I went and auditioned with these guys and got the gig. I was 15 years old playing bars every weekend. My dad had to drive me to the gigs and stay with me. That's the only way the bars would let me in to play is if my yeah. dad was with me. 
So we, after we kind of started playing the same kind of circuit for a while and I got my driver's license, they were cool with letting me drive on my own, and come without dad, but dad, my dad always tagged along with me. I, he always got a kick out of watching me play. Um, but uh, yeah, so 15 years old playing professionally every weekend in a cover band. Um, then when we moved back to Kansas City after, after I graduated high school, um, I started, uh, just, um, I'm a huge blues fan. I'm the resident blues guy here at More Music. And um, I started a blues trio called Blues Train. And we played the Kansas City area uh, through the early, early to mid 90s. And just played quite a bit. Had a, had a lot of fun with that band. Moved to Connecticut and that's where uh, we formed King Whack. Okay. A couple, of, right. couple of Berkeley graduates. Berkeley School of Music graduates in Hartford, Connecticut, and we formed King Whack, which started as a cover band, but we started, we just, we just say, hey, let's write a song, and it, it came so easy, we just kept writing, and we're like, this is pretty good, and uh, that band morphed into just an all-original band, and um, we had, we, we played New England, South, South Massachusetts, all of Connecticut. I think New York a couple of times, but we had a lot of fun with that band. That's killer. Yeah, the the recording that you let me that I, I think I put on CD for you from back in yeah. the day or something. Yeah. I, that was really good stuff. Yeah, killer. Thanks. And are you still working with somebody from that band in the well, Kings? In, in, or we are Kings, correct? In 2010, Ed, there was a three-piece band, me, Ed, and Joe. Um, in 20, 2009, 2010, 2009, 2010, Ed and I got back together um, and wrote and record an album's worth of music long distance, mm -hmm. you know, trading files online. He was in Connecticut, I was in Northern Kentucky at the time. And that was my first attempt at doing that, which I, I was just amazed at that process and how easy that was and, and how really great it turned out. Um, and now we're, some time went by and now we're, we're at it again. We're, uh, we changed the band name to We Are Kings it's the original three guys, me, Ed, and Joe, and we're writing and recording again. That is that is great. Um, and I got my. I'm still trying to work on my original blues, new blues band, Pressure Valve. I'm writing music right now. It's going to be an all original blues. Yeah, thing, the, so. the few things you've put on Facebook, I'm really looking forward yeah. to, to hearing that as well. Just I'm getting older, man, and I get home from work and I'm dead tired. <laughs> I need to be working on music, oh, yeah. and I'm. Exhausted, but that's okay. I'm going to get it done. How do you approach something like that, especially when I know a lot of people, you know, just look for advice on you with guitars, say somebody who might be, you know, older, hadn't played for well, a while? Well, I mean, I identify with a lot of my customers. You know, I'm, I'm 50 now. Um, a little over a year ago, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So if you see me shaking a little bit, that's what that is. Um, that hasn't affected me too bad, but it, it, it does affect my playing to a certain degree. Um, you know, it takes me a, a lot longer to get warmed up, um, and there's just certain picking techniques I just can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm learning to adapt to that right now, and what I learning what I can do and what I can't do, and just coming to grips with that. Um, but I'm not going to let it beat me. I'm not going to let it stop me from playing. But other than that, you know, there's fatigue that comes along with that. So like I said, I, I work here full time, so I get home at the end of the day, and in my mind I want to I want to work on my music, but I'm just tired. Believe it or not, when you, you spend all day talking about and being around guitars, you get home and you just want to not think about guitars for a little yeah, bit. Right. <laughs> just for a little bit, although just, I still end up on social media looking at guitars in the evenings. For sure. Well... Have you ch changed your taste in the way you like a guitar to feel or sound as opposed to when you were younger? Well, I'm, I'm starting to come to grips. Again, this is adapting to the Parkinson's thing a little bit, but I'm, I'm liking lighter strings, mm -hmm. um, slinkier feel. You know, that's why you talked about the top wrap on the Les Paul. Um, discovering ways to make it easier to play. Yeah. Um, other than that, you know, weight is starting to become an issue. You know, this is this this is a good weight for a Les Paul, about eight and a half pounds. Yeah. Um, but standing after a while with a heavy guitar, you know, that 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 
cause us some trouble. So I'm, I'm paying more attention to what's the weight of the guitar, is it too heavy, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also learning that I like fatter necks, mm -hmm. which I never really thought, as a, as a younger man, I never dreamed of liking a fat neck, like a you know, 59 neck on this Les Paul. Um, I love it. it, it I, I, I find that I get less fatigued. I thought it would be more, cause more fatigue, yeah. but I mm -hmm. actually get less fatigued playing a big neck because it fills the hand more. It feels like I've got some support there because yeah. it's exactly the same way, especially yeah. in the last 10 years, I'm liking heavier and heavier necks all the time. Yeah. And it, it definitely doesn't wear my hand out nearly but as I, quickly. But I don't like a round radius. Mm. Those are things that I'm paying more attention to yeah. as I get older and what I like and don't like. It used to be, I, I just give me a guitar, any guitar, I'll mm -hmm. just play it, you know. But now it's, yeah, there's, there's certain criteria. You know, the, I love the vintage reissue Fender stuff, the custom shop relics, and, but they've all got that 6.25 or 7.25 oh, yeah. radius yeah. fingerboard, not, and I can't, I like the big beefy neck, but I can't get along with the round radius. So the 12 inch radius on the Gibson stuff really is, is, is great. And even the 10 inch radius on the Paul Reed Smith stuff is pretty good. So other than Eddie Van Halen, who mm -hmm. are some of the other people that influenced you? Well, I would say the names that come to mind quickly are Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page, Stevie Ray Vaughan, um, Ty Tabor from King's X has been a huge influence uh, for many years. Um, Eric Clapton, uh, Buddy Guy. Um, All the unknowns. Yeah. You just really right, like those. Yeah. Things. Yeah. <laughs> and there's some. There's some great. I'm. You know. That's the great thing about satellite radio and social media is I'm discovering new people all the time. That you know. There's some great. Uh, some great female guitar, blues guitar players out there. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. they're just fantastic. Um, so I'm discovering a, a lot of great stuff now. And fortunately, there's a there's a small club here in Evansville that's been bringing a lot of those bands in, so I get to see them. Is that Mojo's? Yeah. About? yeah. Yeah, they they do have some good acts that come through here. What what was your path to the blues? I mean, I I know very few people my age who was like, they got to the blues through the blues. Mm -hmm. So you, was it the blues rock kind of 70s, 80s guitarist that I think pushed that's, you to I go kinda, deeper I kind of lean towards some of that stuff, but I, I think if I, if I really take a second to think back, what, what kind of really started the love of it for, I think it was Steve Ray Vaughan. Mm -hmm. I think just, he blew my mind. And um, I think that was my real, you know, once once you get into Stevie Ray Vaughan, and then you start finding out what Stevie listened to, and what he grew up listening to, and mm -hmm. what, how where he got his chops from, like Albert King, and then you go down the rabbit hole, and you start discovering all these other fantastic artists that, that you know. It's really great that the blues seems that every generation there is at least one player that comes up that kind of revitalizes mm -hmm. the interest in it. Mm -hmm. um, because for me, it was Johnny Winter. Mm -hmm. After I saw Johnny Winter, it was it was so just different than anything else that I had heard live, but just as powerful and, you know, blow your hair back. Right. And it was the same thing. I wanted to find out where did he get all this stuff from. Yeah. And I think Stevie did the same thing for a lot of people. I think, you know, John Mayer's probably done the same thing for a lot of people. And... and uh Bonamassa now. I mean, he's one yeah. of my favorites, and I, he's one of the guys that's that's keep keeping the uh, keeping the blues alive and bringing it to a whole new, younger audience. And then again, you kind of go down the well. If I like Bonamassa, I might like some of the other groups that he grew up listening to. And then you kind of go down the rabbit hole again. And I've I've always done that. I've always looked at okay. Well, if I like this person, then I'm probably going to like what they like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jared James Nichols, another mm. one. He was, I know you were the one that introduced me to him, and he came in here and did a, did a few videos with us and spent some time here at the store. And he, he, he's incredible. Yeah. He was 
he's blown up now. I mean, he's huge and, and still growing, but he was posting these little just short Facebook videos playing from his room at his home and just these short little videos and it was like I couldn't believe it I mean this guy had the the sound and the look and the the chops and was playing all this you know playing Leslie West licks and stuff like that and with no pick <laughs> <laughs> I know his technique is just incredible yeah and he's a, he's a he blows my mind well how um I want, everybody seems to have the story of the guitar that got away. I wish I would have never let that one out of my hands. Is there one like that that sticks out for you? There's two. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. The first one is a, a, a real, I don't, I, never, I, I, know, I don't know what the date was because I was a kid when I had the guitar and I didn't, I didn't get it then. So it was just a guitar to me, but I had an, an original uh what I have to assume was a 70s gold top deluxe Les Paul. Mm -hmm. That was my first Les Paul. But I, this was when I was in high school and Guns N' Roses was huge and I wanted to be like Slash and I, I didn't have humbuckers in my Les Paul. So we took it, got it routed out and had Seymour Duncan humbuckers put in it. And then I eventually traded that guitar off for a, for a, a black and gold custom Les Paul. Well, it sounds like Which you didn't was, do wrong. It didn't do bad, and I kept that guitar for a long time. But I, the, yeah. that, you know, that gold top deluxe, I wish I still had. Yeah, I, I, I have one of those still, and I felt like it was a compromise when I got it because I wanted the humbuckers, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't do it yeah. at the time that yeah. I got it. Yeah. So many times I've almost gotten rid of it but for some reason I didn't and I'm well you look really at the values glad. on them now and it's a uh, home oh, hanging on to this I know, it's <laughs> crazy now but for a long time you know you couldn't give them away the, the other guitar was a um, I really I love Paul Reed Smith guitars too I don't I've owned several through the years I don't currently own one which is a shame and I'm sure I will again but I I had a I had a couple of PRS's back in the early 90s one of them was one that they don't make anymore. It was called an EG, EG3, I think. It was a hum, single hum mm. pickup configuration. It was very stratty. It looked like a strat. It was a sunburst, had a pick go, you know, a strat style pick guard on it. Loved that guitar. That was my blues train guitar. Um, and then when I got married and then my first son was on the way, that's when I did the big gear dump of like, freaked out like crap I'm gonna need I'm gonna need some money I'm starting <laughs> yes. a family here so I did the big gear dump and, and that's when I got rid of that guitar and I wish I had that one back yeah those those are a couple of good stories there it makes me want to get out the Kleenex especially <laughs> for that deluxe I know how I would yeah we all have a few of those oh how there was you, another one I'm sorry there's a, I just thought of a I had a that, around that same period, I had a uh, late 70s Strat, sunburst maple fingerboard Strat, three bolt neck. Ooh. Yeah. I got rid of that in that same gear dump. In gear dump, yeah. Yeah. You got to make the sacrifices for the family. You had That's to do just it. Just what happened. Had to do it. I w I w I'd do it again if you know if I was in the same boat. But yeah, got to. Well, as far as your journey into the world of musical retail. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that, because I know you were not always the guitar slinger. Well, um, I, I mean, I started in music retail at about 19 years old. Um, again, this is back in the blues train days, early 90s, just out of high school, going to college, and uh, started working part-time in the local music store there in Kansas City and uh, mainly as a guitar teacher but was kind of helping it fill in some part-time sales hours just as they needed somebody to fill in mm -hmm. and kind of found out by mistake I was kind of pretty good at it and so I started teaching less and working in the shop more um, and at that time we had two stores 
and uh, the smaller store, which is what I, where I was working, and then there was a larger uh, second store. Um, but they ended up making me manager of the, the larger store, and I was working full time, and I, I just I loved it. I, you know, I never would have thought that that's where I would have ended up, but I just kind of by default ended up doing it, and I loved it, and I got to be around guitars all the time, and I made pretty good money, and um, had a lot of fun. But again, I got married, first kid on the way, mm -hmm. freaked out. Oh God, I can't support a family on what I'm making working in this guitar shop. So I started asking around our reps that were coming in at the time from various companies. I started kind of asking them for advice. And uh, this one particular rep from a company called Command Music, uh, based out of Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, rep was named, uh, his name was Mike. and. Uh, he kind of took me under his wing a little bit and said, well, you might really enjoy what I do. He sells guitars and accessories to the music stores, mm -hmm. and he travels around, has a sales territory, and he travels around and visits the music stores and, and sells them equipment then to sell to the customer. So I'm like, yeah, that might be cool. And um, he goes, well, you'll probably have to start as like an inside, like a sales phone service rep, at, you know, but, and work your way up out into a sales territory. And at that time, they, that company had a, a, a branch out of San Antonio, Texas. So long story short, Mike introduced me to his boss. I went to San Antonio, interviewed with him. His name was Dave. We hit it off like we were old friends. He hired me. I moved to San Antonio, and I started working for Command Music out of San Antonio, Texas as an inside sales rep and um, was there a year, and they quickly moved me to the headquarters in Hartford, Connecticut. So we moved to Hartford, which was a huge culture shock. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I worked there as an inside sales rep for several years and did the, the King Whack thing. and had, We had a lot of fun in Connecticut. Um, what was the big culture shock? I'm not, I, I never have spent a lot of time in the Northeast. Well, the, the weather. Oh, yeah, the yeah. San Antonio came. to there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, even just from the Midwest to New England yeah, was a bit different. And just, you know, they're Patriots fans there, and <laughs> I'm a Chiefs fan. <laughs> I, I'm sure that um, that was a hard adjustment to make. Yeah, I know. Uh, but, uh, you know, the people were great. I always, people were always, when we were making the move there, I, I can't tell you how many people said, oh, the people in the Northeast are, you know, mm. might not might be some personality conflicts kind of thing warning me that people might not be so friendly and I didn't find that to be true at all and everybody was great. Then was it after that point immediately that you connected up with more music and no, more guitars? Uh, so we left we, an the outside sales rep for command that I was partnered with when I was in Connecticut he was working a sales territory that included Kentucky, Southern Ohio, Southern Indiana. He left the company to go to Fender. So since I was already in with the same customers and knew everybody, was calling on everybody from the inside, um, they thought I'd be a good match, a good replacement for Mike out in the field. So they moved me to Northern Kentucky and I took over his position oh, okay. as the outside sales guy for Command Music in Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and then they added West Virginia to that. So I, I worked, I did that job for about 12 years. And Pat Moore was one of my customers. Okay. And then, right. uh, that changed to Brett Mulzer, and Brett and I hit it off immediately. And Brett was one of my top customers. And uh, things were changing at Command. I wasn't as happy as I was through the years with them. and. Brett and I got to talking, and the opportunity arose to, to come here to Evansville and work for Brett, and I've uh, been here for about nine years now. Well, we are so glad that that opportunity happened. So it was a long you. journey to get here, <laughs> but yeah. I'm here. Well, and I always think it's got to take something special to, to have the kind of passion for doing this that you do, because we are not the easiest customers, and I'm talking about musicians mm -hmm. in general. We're not the easiest customers to deal with. You have to remind yourself, we've had some really interesting discussions around here recently 
about just reminding ourselves why we're here and what got us here. And think back to being a kid and discovering the instrument for the first time and getting that first electric guitar and what that felt like and getting the second guitar, the, you know, upgrading to the, the next guitar and what that felt like and what it felt like to hang out at the guitar shop and talk to the, the cool guitar guys and just, you know, that's, that's some, I have some really, we all have really fond memories of those times. Yeah. And then coming to the realization that, okay, we're now that for these kids that are coming in our store. We need to make sure that we're making the experience for these kids just as great, if not greater, than what our experience was. And that's why we're here. We're not here. Yeah. I mean, we need to sell guitars. That's what our business is founded sure. on. But it's, it's, it's just so much more than that. And, and we've, we've just been talking about... You know, what's the, buy, the guitar buying experience and what should it be and, and to identifying that and then just doing everything we can to make that happen for people. It sure appears that you're being really successful at that. I mean, you've got a, a crew here, both in the brick and mortar and, you know, in the back with the online stuff. Mm -hmm. Everybody is bringing something unique to this place in general mm -hmm. and it's just so interesting for me you know just you know being a videographer and I just get to observe a lot there is nobody here phoning it in no. everybody here is just really digging what they do they see the importance of what they're offering to mm -hmm. musicians mm -hmm. and it's just such a cool environment to be in yeah we're all on the same page and um, you know, I think we 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 meet a lot and we talk a lot about these types of things. And um, again, we've we've had some some pretty interesting meetings recently of just getting back into the right frame of mind and really understanding why we're here and why we do what we do. Well, I th I think you're doing a great job on keeping the focus on that. Yeah. I see that with. Everybody in the store, whether they're dealing with customers or not, that well, they seem to have that in mind. We understand that the only thing that makes us different than the other online music stores and the other brick and mortar stores, we all have, we're all selling pretty much the same product with a few exceptions. So what makes us different? It's us. We, we make the difference. We need to understand that and try to portray that. We need to do a better job of portraying that, you know. Yes, we have black Stratocasters. You can get one from us, you can get one anywhere. But we need to give you the reasons why you should get that black Stratocaster from us. Right. And then that needs to be real and legit and heartfelt. And I think one, one of the things that I see here too is I know I talk to a lot of people who have the idea that we are a much larger staff than we are because mm -hmm. we cover a lot of territory. Most of the people here are wearing multiple hats. Yeah. That's what I think that's what makes us real is that we, although we present ourselves as maybe something larger than what we are, we back it up mm -hmm. in terms of product and service. The same guys that are answering the phones are the guys that are in the videos and yeah. on the, any of the advertisements and on the social media. It's us. I mean, there's no, you know, there's not the, the TV crew and then the sales crew, and those are separate crews. I mean, it's, there's eight or ten of us, and that's it. And <laughs> yeah, that's exactly the point I was trying to make. You don't have to go through layers of, you know, phone people right. and, you know, when you, when you call... You're going to talk to Rob, or you're going to talk to Ed, or you're going to talk to Corey, mm -hmm. the people who Hannah. are and Hannah or yeah. and Scott, every, Scott, yeah. but the people who dealt with you when you got the guitar are just a phone call away from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to talk to you. Anything that you think that customers need to know about more guitars that they may not? The day your new guitar arrives should be one of the greatest days ever, and we do everything we can to make it just that. And Unfortunately, there's, there's a, there's, every once in a while something happens and, and that day is not what it should be and 
we feel that too. We feel that with you. Um, it bums us out too. Um, I've always, you know, we're, we're human and we're going to make a mistake every once in a while. Um, I've always felt like it's not the mistake, it's how you fix the mistake that, that matters. Um, and if, if something happens and Guitar Day isn't what it should be, we'll make it up to you. We'll make it up to you. Um, that's just it. You know, we're just, we're a bunch of guitar goofballs and we really enjoy what we do and we want to make your day with a new guitar. That's great. And he, I, I will agree, we, we do, uh, we do meet the criteria of goofballs here. But well, as I, mean, I always say, these guys know the gear better than any music store. We're that kids I've in ever a candy store too. With. We're kids in the candy store too. Yeah. And we love seeing the new gear come through and we get excited when the new Les Pauls come in and the new strats and um well, hey, you know, hey man, did you see that? <laughs> you know, know, we're showing stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man, I saw that already. <laughs> we're always showing stuff off to each other and no, we have a good time. You know, it's we it's serious work, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. I mean it's it's rock and roll, it's guitars. It is. And we're just happy to be here. Definitely. And I am so just thankful that I get an opportunity to work with you. Oh, likewise. Everything here. But, you know, this is the man, Rob Arnold. Uh, like I say, the, our online matchmaker. And resident blues guy. Old, resident old blues guy. <laughs> we'll call it blues guy. <laughs> you, uh, you don't qualify as old yet. Okay. I'll, let, I'll talk to you about old one of these days. Okay. Y'all, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Rob, thank you, for coming in and talking yeah, to us time. all. More guitars. This is your store. It's coffee time.